As well as introducing humanity to the concepts of trench warfare, the terror of massed machine guns and the lumbering tank, World War I also caused the rapid development of military aviation, giving the world the first aerial dogfights and charismatic air aces. But it also ushered in the terror of aerial bombing, where for the first time in warfare civilians could be targeted by an enemy nation, leading to enormous changes in the daily lives of those who stayed at home. But hitting enemy soil was often extremely difficult, owing to primitive aircraft and large distances but the Germans took the lead in solving these issues, and extending World War I from the killing fields of Flanders to the hitherto safe British Isles. And the greatest target for them was the sprawling metropolis of London, the beating heart of the world's biggest empire. How to bomb London caused much planning in Germany. The Germans had first managed to land a few bombs on the city on the 31st of May 1915, when a huge Zeppelin airship struck. The Zeppelins bombed all over Britain in 1915-16, creating fear and confusion out of all proportion to the damage that they inflicted, until improvements in British aircraft designs and incendiary ammunition began to take their toll on the Zeppelin fleet, many meeting fiery destruction over England. But no one had managed to bomb London using an aeroplane, it was almost beyond the capabilities of the Germans to reach the city, bomb and return, but not quite impossible. In November 1916, the Imperial German Navy decided to try. The propaganda value of bombing London was too great to ignore. And the raid would pave the way for the first strategic bombing campaign using aircraft in history, as Germany developed the large Gotha bombers. But the Goethe had yet to enter service. Another type would be utilised instead, and a highly experienced flight crew assembled for the historic attack. Leutnant Zerze Walter Ilges was chosen to make the raid. He was no stranger to bombing England, for he had already struck the south coast three times in 1916, bombing Dover on the 24th of April and the 12th of August, and Sheerness on the 22nd of October. But the Kent coast is not London, the capital lying a further 83 miles inland. Ilges would command the raid and fly as observer in a two-man reconnaissance machine, the LVG C4, an up-engine derivative of the successful LVG C2 introduced in 1915. LVG had previously built dirigibles, which was appropriate for where Ilge's aircraft was to be sent, considering the Zeppelin attacks that had already occurred. The aircraft was also a light bomber, able to carry up to 243 pounds of ordnance. It was powered by a Mercedes 220 horsepower straight 8 engine, with a maximum airspeed of around 106 miles per hour, with a service ceiling of just over 19,500 feet and an endurance of just over three and a half hours. Ilges would be in the rear cockpit, map reading, observing, taking photographs, and manning the single 7.92mm Parabellum MG-14 machine gun. His pilot was Warrant Officer Paul Brandt, and he had a single forward-firing 7.92mm LMG-0815 machine gun firing through the large propeller. For the mission, the LVG was armed with six 10 kg or 22 pound high explosive bombs. Ilges had decided to target the Admiralty Building in Whitehall, the heart of the government district in London and the administrative headquarters of the Royal Navy. On the morning of the 28th of November 1916, Brandt and Ilges took off from their base at Maria Kirke near Ghent in Belgium 
central London lay about 186 miles, or 300 kilometers, to the west. By cruising along at high altitude, Ilgez believed he could extend his range to about four hours and make it back to Mariakerka. But such an attack would be at the limit of his aircraft's capabilities. On the return journey, his plane would be much lighter, minus its bombs, half its fuel, and have a tailwind, so it would have a good chance of making German-occupied Belgium. The LVG slowly climbed to an altitude of 13,000 feet as it crossed the English Channel. Ilgez had plotted a careful course. He skirted the coastal town of Sheerness and its anti-aircraft guns, and flew inland west of the settlement, passing over Maidstone in Kent. No one on the ground saw or heard the German bomber as it was flying very high, and all observations were made visually. When the LVG reached Rygate, Ilgez ordered Brunt to turn north. Peering over the side through a slight haze, Brunt followed the railway lines that led straight to central London. By 11.45 a.m. the LVG was over London. Ilgez was thrilled. He had made history in bringing a fixed-wing German aircraft over the British capital. Now he would make history again by bombing it. Peering intently over the side with binoculars and referencing continually to his map, Ilgez believed he was over the Admiralty building. At 11.50 he dropped the first bomb manually over the side, followed in quick succession by five more. Ilgez was actually about one mile off target, which considering his only aiming device was the human eyeball, wasn't bad. The bombs landed in a staggering line across a heavily populated area of West London called Knightsbridge and Belgravia. The first bomb struck 108 Brompton Road, injuring a woman. The second damaged 15 Pavilion Road, home of the London Milk Association, injuring another woman. Bomb number three exploded in the back garden of 13 Lowndes Square, damaging the roof, while number four detonated in the road at Belgrave Mews East, injuring four men and a woman, and blowing in windows all along the street. Bomb number five blew up in the back of 112 Eaton Square, damaging the house and four other properties, plus three more in Eccleston Mews. Flying glass wounded two women. The last bomb hit the roof of Victoria Palace Music Hall, wrecking a dressing room and injuring a woman cleaner. The detonation smashed windows in five adjacent buildings. Satisfied with the bomb bursts far below, an exultant Ilgez ordered Brunt to turn southeast and head back to the Channel Coast in Kent. In London, few people realized that they had just been bombed. The plane was neither seen nor heard in the busy, noisy streets, while the bomb blasts were registered as gas explosions by those further away from them. An hour passed before the authorities realized a raid had occurred, and fighters were scrambled to hunt the intruder. By the time the first Royal Flying Corps biplanes had got aloft, the LVG was passing near Hastings and heading out over the English Channel. However, when they were about halfway across the channel, Brandt and Ilge's engines started misfiring and straggling. The altitude began to drop, and Ilge's desperately tried to lighten the machine, pitching his machine gun and ammunition overboard, followed by the heavy reconnaissance camera and its glass plates. But it was no good. The LVG would not make it to Maria Kerker or indeed to the German lines. Brandt was forced to make an emergency landing in a field on the French coast near Boulogne. Ilgez and Brandt managed to burn the LVG before French troops arrived and took them prisoner. When the German high command discovered Ilgez and Brandt's fate, they immediately issued instructions to keep the raid quiet. What was supposed to have been a great propaganda victory for Germany, the first aircraft bombing of London, instead became an embarrassment. But it was important, because it would pave the way for the coming Gotha Offensive. And, handily, I've already made a video about this fascinating topic. Link in the end screen. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and share. And also visit my new audiobook channel, War Stories with Mark Felton. 
You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon. Details in the description box below.